um, we're continuing our series uh, in Matthew's Gospel. Um, Two days ago, on Good Friday, we heard that Jesus is God's King. And not just is he God's King, he's God's King who suffers. Why? Because the people are guilty. We'll think more about that uh, a little bit later on. But Easter Day is when Christians celebrate Jesus rising um, from the dead. And we're going to get straight into giving God all the glory for his resurrection as we sing our first song in a moment. Um, Just to say, if you are watching at home, uh, we've had a few fun electrical things uh, happening in the church in the last couple of days. Um, You may not be able to hear the music. If you can't hear the music, we will come back. Um, but you just will have to wait for us to sing, uh, and then we will come back. Um, uh, the way that the uh, sound is working uh, means that you may well be switched off uh, while we sing, but then we will switch back on again. Um, so please don't give up on us. Uh, we're coming back. Um, but we are going to sing, if we're here in the building, we're definitely going to sing our first song this morning. We're going to stand and sing, Thine be the glory, because Jesus is our risen, conquering Son of God. take a seat. What a joy it is to have the full organ playing on Easter Sunday 
uh, morning with us. And we are going to start by praying the prayer of preparation. The words uh, of the prayer are going to appear on the screen behind me. Let's pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. I said we'd come back to what we learned on Good Friday. We heard on Good Friday that the people are guilty because it was the crowd that joined in shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And it was the crowd that says, we are very happy to be responsible for Jesus' blood as he dies. It's on us, they said. They were guilty. But the Bible tells us that all of us reject God. An easy way uh, that we might remember uh, what sin is in the Bible is it stands for S-I-N. Shove off God. I'm in charge. No to your rule. S-I-N. Sin. We are all guilty. We all say shove off God. We all try to live lives our own way, um, as the song goes. We all say no to God ruling our lives. Uh, we do this every day in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds. And so it's right for us to confess these sins before God, to ask for his forgiveness for the ways that we've tried to shut him out of our lives. So we're going to pray together. We're going to confess our sins to Almighty God. Again, the words are on the screen. Let's pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. We heard on Good Friday uh, that we are guilty, but we also heard on Good Friday that Jesus suffers because the people are guilty. He died in our place as a sacrifice for sin, to swap places with us so that he takes all the punishment that we deserve, so that we might be forgiven, washed clean, cleansed, and set free uh, to serve him. And so wonderfully, that gives us confidence, uh, not just um, that our sins are forgiven, but also that we will enter God's eternal heavenly kingdom. We'll be with him in heaven forever through our Lord Jesus Christ. And it also means that right now, we can pray with confidence, knowing that Jesus hears our prayers and delights to answer them for his glory and for our good. So with that in mind, let's pray a prayer written, especially for today, Easter Day. Lord of all life and power, who through the mighty resurrection of your Son overcame the old order of sin and death to make all things new in him, Grant that we, being dead to sin and alive to you in Jesus Christ, may reign with him in glory, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be praise and honour, glory and might, now and in all eternity. Amen. Um, we're going to just have a brief time of notice. Um, please do join us um, for tea uh, and coffee after the service, although please don't necessarily switch on the electrics uh, up here unless you've been instructed to do so. Um, just that caused issues with the electrics on Friday. Um, uh, but we, God willing, we will have tea and coffee afterwards. There's still some hot cross buns, so we can enjoy those still uh, on Easter Day. Um, this evening, uh, our local group of partner churches are having a joint service 
celebrating Easter today um, at 6.30 at Grove Hill Evangelical Church, very close to the waterworks uh, roundabout. You can get the 123 bus from here to go and join in with that if you'd like to. Our very own Tim Cole is going to be preaching uh, on Mark's Gospel, uh, Mark chapter 16, uh, verses 1 to 8. And we have none of our midweek groups uh, are running this week because uh, of the Easter holidays. Um, but on Saturday, the 12th uh, of April, I think we've got a slide hopefully showing this. Do we? Maybe we do. Um, uh, oh, one more, maybe? Let's have a look. Yes, here we go. We've got an evening um, with a superb classical guitarist, Mihail Mahatic, uh, again up at Grove Hill Evangelical Church. Tickets are £5. The real aim is not for Christians on our own just to fill that up and enjoy the evening. The aim is to bring our non-Christian friends and family members, people who would love to hear great guitar music, but also hear that being interweaved with testimony uh, about the Christian faith uh, and all God has done for us in the Lord Jesus. Tickets are £5. There's flyers available at the back. If you scan the QR code on that, um, that'll take you, take you to the ticket portal uh, website so you can buy your tickets um, there. I think it's first come, first served. Um, next Sunday, we might go back one slide, um, Nina, if that's okay. Next Sunday, uh, we're finishing our series in Matthew's Gospel. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 28, uh, verses 16 to 20. And then next Sunday, after church, we'll have our regular bring and share um, Sunday church lunch. Uh, please do plan to join us for that if you can. And then Christianity Explored, we advertise this every Sunday. It is a great way to explore the Christian faith to think about the best news you've ever heard and then realize that if it's not the Lord Jesus Christ, then you haven't fully understood uh, him coming uh, in the first place. If you'd like to do Christianity Explored, please speak to me. Please speak to Corey, our women's and families worker, to Tim, uh, our minister in training. We'd be delighted to make that possible for you. We're going to sing another really great Easter song. Sorry if that means we disappear. For those of you at home, we are coming back. Uh, again, but we're going to sing a great Easter song celebrating that Jesus really did rise from the dead. He has risen. Let's stand and sing together.
take a seat. And welcome back if you're with us online. Lovely to have you back. Um, we are going to sing, uh, we've just sung, uh, He Has Risen. Uh, we're going to have the opportunity now for our children and young people um, to head out uh, to groups. Uh, there is Little Diggers with Simon, who's just waving now. That is for those um, not yet of school age. If you would like to head downstairs uh, with Simon in a few moments. Um, Corey is going to be, Corey is at my back right, your front left. Um, Corey is going to be taking all of those of primary school age. So all our explorers, all our adventurers are going to go down with Corey and with Omar this morning. Um, I'm just going to pray for all of us. Uh, that we would rejoice and celebrate in the good news of Easter in all of our ages and groups. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we do praise you and thank you that Jesus is risen. He has risen from the grave. Uh, and thank you for all the wonderful things that that means for us if we are your people. Uh, and thank you for the hope it gives all of us of eternal life if we trust in him. Father, please uh, would you have mercy on us of all ages this morning? Please, would you thrill our hearts with the news of Jesus risen from the dead? Amen. Um, so if the children and young people would like to head down to their groups uh, now. Um, And if you're visiting us and you're not sure about the groups, um, please do. Um, why not go and speak to one of those at the back or at the side? They'd be delighted to tell you more um, so that your child can join in uh, as well. Now, in a moment, we're going to have our Bible reading. I think Diana are you expecting, Diana is expecting to come and read from us from the Bible. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 27 uh, and 28. Um, and then Simon Rafferty is going to be coming to preach for us. Simon was with us a week ago. We got to meet him. He's visiting us from a partner church uh, and is going to be bringing our Easter Day uh, sermon to us. So I'm going to hand over to Diane now, and then Simon's going to uh, come up and preach God's word for us. Thank you. Good morning, church. If you'd like to follow in the Bible, we're on page 1000, and we're starting at verse 57. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea, named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of a rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. The last deception will be the worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, and for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. 
The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. How's that? Yes, you can hear me. So I'm going to crouch down for the next 25 minutes. Um, if you can't hear me because it's too low, you just need to wave your arms at me and I will, I'll speak up. Uh, but I hope, hopefully we'll be okay. Well, yeah, good morning. Um, really great to be back with you all today um, after seeing you last week. Um, and if you're joining us uh, at home as well, then I'd also like to say yeah, good morning and a happy Easter to you. Uh, today is Easter Sunday and we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus died on a Roman cross but on that first Easter Sunday, God raised him back to life. That is the Easter claim that we're celebrating today. Now, last week, I told you that I grew up in a Baptist church, and this was down in a town in West Sussex. Uh, that's where I grew up. Um, and every year on Good Friday, all the churches in the area would gather in the town center as a kind of Good Friday uh, witness to the town. All these churches would gather together. And, and it was a really fantastic thing to be a part of. Um, and, and I remember it being a deeply uh, emotional day, um, emotional as we considered what Jesus had suffered on our behalf, dying for my sins so that I could be forgiven. I remember those Good Fridays well as a really emotional experience. But the Easter Sundays, uh, well, I don't re really remember those very well at all. Um, and I think, looking back, that is because I didn't really understand Easter. I, I used to think... Well, I, I get why Jesus needed to die for my sins. He died so that I could be forgiven. I felt I understood that. But why did he need to rise? Wasn't the story finished that first Good Friday as Jesus breathed his last for my sins? And I think to answer that this morning, we need to remember what is this story that Matthew is telling? What really is the story that we're looking at, the story of Easter? Well, this is the story of how Jesus became king. It's the story of how Jesus became king. Uh, yes, it is also the story of how I can be forgiven and enter his kingdom. Yes, that's true. And that's also what Easter is about. But at its heart, Easter is the story of how Jesus became the world king. And that was Nathan's point on Friday, wasn't it? For those of us who were here uh, or listening in. As Jesus hung there dying even, he died as king. He died as the king like David, if you like, 
uh, just as David described in his song in Psalm 22. That's what we learned on Friday. Jesus died as king, and God raised him from the dead. Why? Well, to begin his reign, to begin his reign. Jesus has risen to reign. That is what Easter Sunday today is all about. Jesus has risen to reign. After all, I mean, we can say all day long that Jesus died a kingly death, but that is no use at all, is it, if he's still in the grave? He can't rule the world from a tomb. And think about the insults of those who mocked him as he hung on that cross. What did they say? He saved others, but he can't save himself. Look at him. Well, if Jesus stayed dead, then the insults of his enemies have gone unanswered. But if Jesus really rose, what we're thinking about today, if he really rose, then the tables have turned, haven't they? He has risen to reign as king. And his enemies who mocked him, well, actually, it turns out they can only lie and deceive, and they can only pretend that it hasn't really happened, as we'll see shortly. And this is all heading towards that astonishing statement in verse 18 of chapter 28. So just look there for a moment in your Bibles. So chapter 28, verse 18, towards the end. Jesus, now risen from the dead, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority in heaven and on earth now given to me, says the risen Lord Jesus. And we'll spend more time on that verse next week when Adam comes to teach. For today, we'll focus on Matthew's evidence. Jesus is really risen. He really is risen. But we're also going to think about the meaning of Easter. And this is the meaning that I think I hadn't quite understood as a teenager. And the meaning of Easter is Jesus has risen to reign. Now, there are two groups of people in today's passage. Two groups of people, two sides who both had a hand in the events of Easter Sunday. And I, I want to give you advance warning that one of these two sides is lying to us. Two sides, one of them is lying. Now on one side, we have two women. They were there at Jesus' death. They saw him breathe his last. And they're there in verse 61 of chapter 27. And they're watching as Jesus is laid in a tomb and a great stone is rolled in front. So we're told in verse 61, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. It's not much to go on, is it? I mean, who are these two women? So I've been wondering about them. Um, and the penny, I think, finally dropped for me this week. They are two women. They are two women. As in, they're just two ordinary people, right? They're common folk. We don't really know very much about them. Now, these two women, they are going to be our key witnesses this morning. It's going to be their word that tells us that Jesus really rose. And so the, the question to be asking yourself at this point is, are these two women going to be enough to base that belief on? Is their word enough to make us sure that Jesus really rose? Well, Let's look at the other side. So two sides, now we're going to look at the other side. And they appear in the next verse, verse 62. So the next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. So here we have the chief priests and the Pharisees. And, and when you hear those names, it's easy to think of them as sort of pantomime villains, isn't it? You know, Boo Hiss, uh, sort of Captain Hook with the big claw, the big hook hand. Well, they are villains. They, they are villains. But they don't look like villains. 
Uh, there are no giant hooks. There's no shouts of, you know, he's behind you. In fact, in many ways, these men, the chief priests and the Pharisees, they are the obvious people to trust that morning. They are the rulers of the Jewish nation. You might say God has appointed them to rule, and they're the Bible teachers. They study the scriptures day and night. They teach the people what God has said in his word, or at least they're supposed to. They run God's temple. That's the chief priests. They run the temple. In many ways, these are the men to trust this morning. They are the obvious foundation for what is true, aren't they? And I want you to imagine for a moment, suppose we could put all of the people in this passage in a line, suppose we could get them in this room and we could ask them to line up, let's say it's stretching from that side of the room over there to the other side of the room over here, and we've got the line of all of these people on these two sides. Now imagine we line them up in order of their Bible knowledge. So let's say we line them up from the ones who know the most Bible over there, we'll put them over there, uh, to the ones who know the least Bible, and we'll put those ones over there. Most Bible, least Bible. Well, these Jewish rulers, the chief priests and the Pharisees, they would be right at that end of the line, wouldn't they? Most Bible. They know their Bibles better than anyone. And the women, um, who remember, we are going to choose to believe instead of believing those rulers. Well, these women, they'd likely be all the way down the other end, or at least somewhere in that direction. They probably only know what the Jewish rulers have taught them. Or let's do the lineup one more time, slightly differently this time. This time we're going to line them up by how much power and influence they have. So you've got most powerful to least powerful. Well, this time at this end of the line, we've got, I guess you've got Pilate, the Roman governor, haven't you? Uh, right at the far end, he's got the power of life and death over all the people in Jerusalem. But next to him, just coming along the line a little bit, well, you've got the Jewish rulers again, haven't you? They had enough influence to get Jesus killed, after all. Right down the other end of the line, then, well, we've got our two women. No real power or influence to speak of, just two women, common folk. Those, those are our two sides. And my question is, are we sure that we should trust the word of these two women and reject the word of those well-taught and influential rulers? Are we sure? Well, now let's go back to the passage and let's see what these rulers are up to. And they're planning something in verse 63, aren't they? So verse 63. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Now these rulers, they believe Jesus was an imposter and, and they're worried that his disciples are gonna to come to continue that fraud now that he's dead. That's what they're worried about. Um, th there's nothing directly sinister about this plan in verse 63. Although it is going to go wrong later uh, when they will realize that Jesus wasn't actually a fraud at all. Uh, it's going to go wrong later, and we'll come to that shortly. But there's nothing directly sinister going on here. So those are the two sides. Now we come to the events of Easter Sunday itself. And this is the point where one of these two sides is going to choose to lie about what happened. This is where the lie will come in. So, chapter 28, verses 1 to 4. Now, it's the first day of the week, a new beginning, a new week. The two Marys go to look, to the, go to look at the tomb. And, and what is it that they see there at the tomb? Well, verse 2, there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. 
an angel come down from heaven and a great earthquake. Now, this kind of thing, it does not happen often, even in the Bible, right? It's, it's not as though we've got an angel on every second page of the Bible. Angels are God's messengers. Uh, the word actually just means messenger. And they appear on God's behalf. That's the point. They appear when God himself, who is in heaven, wants to send a message down from heaven to earth. So think of, for example, Moses and the burning bush, where the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a flame and God spoke. Or think of the pillar of fire that led Israel out of Egypt during the Exodus. God himself leading Israel across the desert through his angel, through his messenger. So what should we make of it then? when an angel appears at the tomb of Jesus on that Sunday morning. What do we make of that? Well, it means that God himself is speaking. God himself is speaking here. It's not just the word of two women, but it is the word of God himself. And the guards shake and become like dead men, that's verse 4, which I think is completely understandable, uh, because they're standing in the presence of God's own messenger. So what does the angel say then? What does God himself have to say? Well, verse 5, the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So what does the angel say? He says, ladies, I know you're looking for Jesus, but he's not here. He has risen. That is what God wants to say to us this morning. And it's not just the word of these two women. God himself has raised Jesus from the dead. And the angel continues, See for yourselves the place where he lay. See the empty tomb for yourselves. Then tell the disciples to go to Galilee because Jesus will be waiting for them there. Jesus is going on to Galilee, and as we'll see next week, he's going there to begin his kingdom, to begin his reign. Remember we said at the start, he has risen to reign as king. And now... Do you see the tables turning? A complete 180 turn. These women who were grieving at the cross, now comforted beyond their wildest imaginations, do not be afraid. He's not here, he has risen. Meanwhile, what about the soldiers? The soldiers are so afraid that they've become like dead men. I mean, who are the victors here, actually? And whose word? Are you going to trust about what happened that day? And look at Jesus himself. I mean, remember, remember the mockery he endured as he hung there dying? He saved others, but he can't save himself. Remember the mockery? Well, friends, he didn't have to save himself because God has raised him from the dead. This is the story of how Jesus, through his death, became the king, and the story of how he was raised back to life by the power of God. So what happens next? Well, verse 8, the women hurry away and they run to tell the disciples, and suddenly they meet the risen Jesus. They meet the risen Jesus. Greetings, he says. 
He's there. I mean, imagine, if you can, their joy. They last saw Jesus when he was taking his final ragged breaths on that cross. And then they saw his corpse laid to rest in a tomb. And now here he is, alive and very much real. How do the women respond? Verse 9, they clasped his feet and worshipped him. They do the obvious thing that you do if you ever meet a king who has just risen from the dead. They bow down and worship him. And, and I don't think this is so much about Jesus being divine, that word worship. I, th I think it is the kind of worship that you give to a ruler or a lord. And again, they're told not to be afraid, but to tell the disciples to meet Jesus in Galilee, where, as we'll see next week, he's now going to begin his kingdom. Jesus has really risen. He has really risen. It's really true. God himself attested to it through an angel. The tomb was empty. These women saw it. And now the women have met the risen Jesus in person. And the tables, they've completely turned. What about the other group? So that's the two women. What about this other group down here, the chief priests with their Bible knowledge and their influence? Well, the guards go running to them and they give actually the same report as the women. Notice that in verse 11, they went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. Now, it's interesting, isn't it? There aren't two different reports that day. There's no misunderstanding at the tomb. Um, everyone there saw the angel. Everyone there saw the empty tomb. There's only one report, and the guards run, and they tell this report to the rulers, to the chief priests. So they hear exactly what happened that morning, what happens next. Well, now we see the true colors of the chief priests, just like we saw their true colors at Jesus' trial on Friday. Remember how they weren't at all interested in the truth then? Well, they're even less interested in the truth now. They've just been told in this report, they have just been told that their Messiah, who they've been waiting for, or they say they have, has risen from the dead. They've just heard their Messiah has actually risen from the dead. What's their response, these Bible teachers? Verse 12, when the chief priests have met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we'll satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So what is their response? Bribery. Hey, soldiers, here's a large bag of money. Lying. Make up a story about his disciples stealing the body. More bribery. If this gets back to the governor, back to Pilate, we'll satisfy him. Don't you worry. I mean, never mind. Never mind how ridiculous this lie is. Did you notice that? How ridiculous it is? The idea that professional Roman soldiers might fall asleep whilst on duty, or that the disciples could steal a body that has been sealed behind a massive stone. Or that these guards could have seen enough to give this report, right, but not been able to stop the disciples from getting away. I mean, it, it is a ridiculous lie, let's be clear on that. Uh, but, but actually, never mind that. Focus on what has happened to these rulers who opposed Jesus. What's happened to them? Remember, these are the men who mocked Jesus as he hung there dying, they hurled insults at him on Good Friday. And remember, on Good Friday, there was no answer. Well, here we are on Easter Sunday, and these men who mocked Jesus are now reduced to passing brown paper bags full of hush money to a group of grubby Gentile soldiers in a dodgy backroom deal. Jesus has risen to reign 
and his enemies are reduced to bribery, lying, if necessary, more bribery. I mean, how the tables have turned for Jesus' enemies. There is a word of warning, though, at the end of verse 14. Just look there, the end of verse 14. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. I mean, yes, a ridiculous lie. It is ridiculous. And yes, these rulers, these enemies, have completely debased themselves, lying and bribery. But for Matthew's first readers, these rulers were still very much alive and very much dangerous. The lie became the official account, and the Jewish people largely believed it. And so to disagree with these rulers and to side with these two women, which is what we're doing this morning, well, what did that mean for the early disciples? I mean, it probably meant being expelled from the synagogue, being cast out by your friends and family. And I I think worst of all, I think worse than that, being treated as though you were outside of God's people, outside of God's covenant, outside of the blessings, and that constant worry that would get into your own head. I mean, was I right to believe in Jesus? Was I right to go with these two women? Or, Or have I really put myself out of the family of God? Well, to that worry, God on Easter Sunday says, he is not here He is risen. Come and see the place where he lay. And so, as we close, I just want us to notice the genius of God's plan. Notice the genius of God's plan. I mean, God's king dying? God's king dying? Who on earth, who in this room would have done things that way? I certainly wouldn't. God's king dying? But God's king dying rising. Well, now you can start to see it. Now nobody can stop him. I mean, the thing about a resurrection is you can't deny who was behind it. That's the thing about a resurrection. You can't deny who was behind it. People do not rise from the dead. There is no empty tomb unless God himself has done it. I mean, it it is such a clever way, such a wise way for God to appoint his king, isn't it? So we can be really sure, Jesus now immortal, he cannot die again, and Jesus now unstoppable. The word is out, the word is out, the word of the resurrection, and no lie can suppress it. Jesus really rose, we can be utterly sure. And God has turned the tables on his enemies. And now Jesus is headed to Galilee, where he'll say to his gathered disciples, he'll say to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus has risen to reign. Let's pray together. Our Father, we praise you so much for raising Jesus from the dead. What an incredible and wise plan. You have set him as king over the whole world with all authority. We thank you for him, and we thank you for making us sure that he really rose. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Simon, thank you so much. What a great message for Easter Day. Um, In a moment, we're going to sing again. Um, On Good Friday, we sang two songs. Um, uh, One was trying to take us through in our mind's eye, um, Jesus there in Jerusalem as he was taken out to die. Uh, Another one uh, was Uh, thinking again about the same day, thinking about the darkness 
of that day. Well, now we're going to try and in our mind's eye, in our next song, visualize the wonder of Easter day, of Jesus risen from the dead. Let's stand and sing, see what a morning. Please do take a seat, and Tim, our minister in training, is going to come and lead us in prayer. Let's pray together. Good morning, everyone. Um, after each prayer, I'm going to say, Christ is risen. And if you uh, agree with that, please say, he is risen indeed. And if you're here this morning and you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, but you feel quite moved by what you've heard this morning about Jesus being alive, Please also feel free to join in saying, he is risen indeed. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the clear eyewitness account that we have heard today from Matthew's Gospel, that Christ is risen. We praise you, Lord God, that death has been defeated once and for all, and that life in the new creation with you is sure because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Lord, help us to cling to this truth through the hardships of life. When sickness comes, or we lose loved ones, or we see the sorry state of our sin-sick world, help us to trust that you are the solution to it all, because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Lord, we're sorry when we forget what you've done through Jesus. We're sorry when we're distracted by worldly things or when our hearts are filled with doubts and wander from you. May we stand by faith on this solid rock that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And Father, we pray for our mission partners, the Innesses in Moldova and Adrian in South Africa. We pray also for our gospel partners in other parts of the world who we cannot publicly name 
because of the risk to their lives in following Jesus. May your spirit provide them with deep comfort this Easter and empower their ministries to keep them proclaiming this glorious truth. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. We thank you, Lord, for Simon and Nathan from St. Helens preaching your word to us this Easter. We pray for them and their families. May they rest in the knowledge of all your spiritual blessings that are theirs in Christ. Would their children grow up to know, love and serve the Lord Jesus? Would their marriages flourish as they sacrificially love their wives? And would they continue in their workplaces and friendship groups and beyond to tell again and again that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And finally, Father, we pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ all over the world. Would you change the hearts of their oppressors to see the beauty of the gospel message that they so unjustifiably hate? Please keep your people persevering in faith and seeking to live quiet lives in peace and godliness. And in your amazing power, Lord, would you grant them opportunities in the midst of persecution to bear witness to this truth that casts out all fear. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. We pray all this in the name of our risen King, the Lord Jesus Christ, and for his glory. Amen. We're now going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. And the Lord's Supper helps Christians to remember and celebrate that Jesus came to save his people from the dead, uh, from their sins and then raise uh, them to new life from the dead. Um, last Sunday, uh, we read in Matthew chapter 26, and we read Jesus saying there that while they were still eating, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, uh, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And Jesus said, I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let's pray. Lord God, we praise you for Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross. We praise you that Jesus died to establish a new covenant with, between you and your people to rescue all who trust in him from your anger and judgment. And now we pray that as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, you may help us by your Holy Spirit to rightly remember Jesus' death for us. As we eat and drink, please help us to proclaim Jesus' death for us to one another. And please would you help us to celebrate the unity that we have in Jesus' death and the certain hope we have in his resurrection because he reigns over all of our people. And so please help us to look forward to and to eagerly anticipate Jesus' return from heaven when all who trust in him will be raised with him and will fully experience the eternal life and the new imperishable heavenly body uh, that you promised we will have in your perfect new creation. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, just before the bread and the wine are passed around this morning, it's right to say that it may not be appropriate for you to eat and drink this morning. And for some, you may, um, it wouldn't be appropriate because you don't yet know or love the Lord Jesus. <coughs> Others may choose uh, not to join in because you know you're not living for the Lord Jesus wholeheartedly or because you're out of relationship with another believer. If any of these things are the case, Please can I urge you to take action in faith. Resolve whatever it is as soon as possible. 
if you are on PT or drinking this morning, uh, please do feel free to come forward if you'd like to for a blessing. I'd be delighted to pray with you and for you. But for the rest of you, let me encourage you to eat and drink the Lord's Supper, not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Eat and drink not because any goodness of your own gives you a right to join in, but because you need mercy and help. Eat and drink because you love the Lord a little and would like to love him more. Eat and drink not because you're worthy to approach him, but because he died for sinners. Eat and drink because he loves you and gave his life for you.
Let me lead us in prayer. <coughs> God of life, who for our redemption gave your only begotten Son to the death of the cross, and by his glorious resurrection have delivered us from the power of our enemy, grant us so to daily die to sin, that we may evermore live with him in the joy of his risen life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to continue in prayer using the words that our Saviour taught us. If you learnt these in a different language when you were first uh, learning these words, um, why not pray them in the language uh, that you first learnt them? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. In a moment, we're going to sing our final song. During that song, there's an opportunity um, to think about giving financially to support us. As under God, we seek to work for North Walthamstow, being transformed by Jesus uh, one life at a time. Uh, there's a plate available at the back. Uh, Anne, who is sat next to it, could also give you details about how you could give uh, directly into the bank. Um, during this song, no, uh, the little digger's are already back with us, so you don't need to collect them during this song. There we go, we're safe. Um, all through this series, though, we've seen that Jesus is God's king. Uh, well, this morning, we've seen that he has risen to reign, and because he reigns, uh, we should rejoice uh, that he reigns over us. So our final song this morning, we're going to stand and sing, Come People of the Risen King. Let's rejoice. Let's stand and sing. <laughs>
pray uh, that like the women, uh, we might leave here this morning filled with joy and go to tell all the world that Jesus reigns. Amen. Please do take a seat. Um, that is the end of our YouTube service uh, this morning. If you've joined us for the first time, we've loved having you with us. Uh, we'll be here again at 10 o'clock next Sunday. We might even uh, be able to let you listen to music uh, during the service as well by next week. Uh, if there's ways we can get in touch with you, please do 